First, we'll discuss congenital heart disease. And the first set of diseases in this category are the right to left shunts. In general, the right to left shunt diseases cause blue baby syndrome or early cyanosis. So these are babies that come out with cyanotic heart disease. And all of these begin with the letter T, so they're very easy to remember. And they include the Tetralogy of Fellow. Remember, the Tetralogy of Fellow is the most common cause of early cyanosis or blue baby syndrome. Also, transposition of the great vessels, primarily D transposition, not L transposition. And we will talk about that later. Truncus arteriosus, tricuspid atresia, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return, or TAPVR. A truncus arteriosus, or persistent truncus arteriosus, is a failure of the truncus arteriosus to divide into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So this causes one large artery coming off both the right and the left ventricle. Tricuspid atresia is characterized by the absence of the tricuspid valve and a hypoplastic right ventricle. With a tricuspid atresia, the patient will require both an ASD and a VSD for viability. TAPVR is when the pulmonary veins drain into the right heart circulation, such as the SVC or the coronary sinus. These patients also will require an ASD for viability. The left to right shunt diseases cause late cyanosis. These children develop cyanosis later in their life when they're young children. And these all have three letter acronyms, the VSD, the ASD, and the PDA. The VSD or the ventricular septal defect is the most common congenital cardiac anomaly. Next comes the ASD, or the atrial septal defect. Remember that these patients will develop a loud S1 and will often have a wide fixed split S2 heart sound. And third is the patent ductus arteriosus, or the PDA. The PDA can be closed by administration of indomethacin as a child. Remember that the ventricular septal defect is the most common cause of cyanosis followed by the atrial septal defect, followed by the patent ductus arteriosus. These patients that have septal defects will often have increased pulmonary vascular resistance due to arteriolar thickening from a chronic left to right shunt. And remember that the chronic left to right shunt over time can shift to pulmonary hypertension and cause a right to left shunt, which is also known as Eisenmenger's phenomenon. Eisenmenger syndrome, or Eisenmenger's phenomenon, is caused by an uncorrected ventricular or atrial septal defect, or patent ductus arteriosus. These start out as left to right shunts, because the pressure in, at first is higher on the left side of the heart than the right. Over time, however, the right side will hypertrophy, and the right heart will then develop higher pressures than the left side of the heart over time. This left to right shunt over time causes a progressive pulmonary hypertension, and as pulmonary resistance increases, the shunt will reverse itself from left to right to a right to left shunt. This causes a late cyanosis, along with often clubbing and polycythemia. Next, we'll discuss the Tetralogy of Fellow. Tetralogy of Fellow, as you can remember, is the most common cause of early cyanosis. The tetralogy is made up of the four findings. Number one, pulmonary stenosis. The pulmonary stenosis is the most important determinant for prognosis. The worse the stenosis is, the worse off the patient is. Followed by right ventricular hypertrophy, overriding aorta, and this is when the aorta overrides the ventricular septal defect so that blood from the right ventricle and the left ventricle enters the aorta. And then finally, ventricular septal defect. This makes the mnemonic prove for the Tetralogy of Fellow. These patients develop an early cyanosis, which is caused by a right to left shunt across the ventricular septal defect. The right to left shunt occurs because of the increased pressure caused by the stenotic pulmonic valve. 
the blood from the right ventricle would rather go through the ventricular septal defect into the aorta than go into the pulmonary artery because there's a higher resistance at the level of the pulmonic valve because of pulmonic stenosis. Therefore, you have a right to left shunt from the right ventricle into the aorta. This is why these patients become cyanotic. These patients will have a boot-shaped heart because of right ventricular hypertrophy. The right ventricle will increase in size and cause the heart to rotate in the chest and increase on the right side. Oftentimes, these patients will suffer cyanotic spells because of increased periodic blood flow from the right ventricle into the aorta. And these patients will learn to squat to improve their symptoms. What they find is that if they squat, the femoral arteries will compress, and that will increase the aortic pressure. As the aortic pressure increases, this will decrease the right to left shunt, because more blood will then be forced into the pulmonary arteries and will direct more blood from the right ventricle into the lungs. The compression of the femoral arteries leads to increased peripheral resistance and increased aortic pressure, and therefore cause more blood from the heart to go into the pulmonary artery and become oxygenated. The tetralogy of Fallot is caused embryologically by the anterior superior displacement of the infundibular septum. One of the other common causes of early cyanosis is detransposition or dextrotransposition of the great vessels. In these patients, the aorta takes off the right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery takes off the left ventricle. The aorta leaves the right ventricle, and therefore you have deoxygenated blood going to the body. This causes a separation of systemic and pulmonary circulations that is not compatible with life unless a shunt is present to allow mixing of the blood. And that shunt could be a ventricular septal defect, a patent ductus arteriosus, or a patent foramen ovale or atrial septal defect. Detransposition of the great vessels occurs embryologically due to failure of the aortical pulmonary septum to spiral. And without surgical correction, most of these infants die within the first few months of life. Next, we'll discuss coarctation of the aorta. Coarctation simply means stenosis of the aortic vessel itself. There are two major types of coarctation of the aorta that you should be familiar with. The infantile type and the adult type. One good way of detecting coarctation of the aorta is to check the femoral arterial pulses on the physical exam. Coarctation of the aorta will always affect the femoral blood pressure. In the infantile type of coarctation, there is stenosis of the aorta that is proximal to the insertion point of the ductus arteriosus. The ductus arteriosus in the adult is called the ligamentum arteriosum. So the infantile type is in close to the heart, and that's one good way to remember it. In the adult type of coarctation of the aorta, the stenosis is distal to the ligamentum arteriosum, or the ductus arteriosus, and is called postductal. So in the adult, it is distal to the ductus. The adult type of coarctation of the aorta is usually associated with rib notching due to collateral circulation, hypertension in the upper extremities, and weak pulses in the lower extremities. Coarctation of the aorta is most commonly associated with bicuspid aortic valve, but is also associated with Turner's syndrome, which is a less common situation than bicuspid aortic valve. And remember that coarctation can also result in aortic regurgitation. Patent ductus arteriosus is very commonly seen. Remember that in the fetal period, the shunt across the patent ductus arteriosus is right to left. In the neonatal period, however, the lung resistance drops because of breathing, and the shunt becomes left to right. If the patent ductus arteriosus stays open, the patient will develop right ventricular hypertrophy and right-sided heart failure. 
This is why large PDA should be diagnosed early and treated. PDAs are associated with a continuous machine-like murmur, which we mentioned earlier. And the patency of the PDA should be maintained by prostaglandin E synthesis and low oxygen tension. A patent duxus arteriosus should be kept open in situations where that shunt is helping keep the patient alive in a situation such as detransposition of the great vessels in which a shunt is necessary. In most patients, however, the patent ductus arteriosus can be closed. Remember that uncorrected PDA can eventually result in late cyanosis because of Eisenmenger's syndrome. For treatment of the PDA, remember endomethacin ends the patency of the PDA, so that's one good way to remember it, and that PGE, prostaglandin E, keeps it open. And that you give prostaglandin in a situation where it's important to keep the patent ductus arteriosus open, such as in conditions such as transposition of the great vessels. A PDA is normal in utero and normally closes only after birth, usually within one to two days. There are multiple congenital diseases, both inherited and infectious, that can cause cardiac defects. For example, chromosome 22 Q11 syndromes can cause truncus arteriosus and tetralogy of fellow. Down's syndrome is classically associated with atrial and ventricular septal defects, as well as an AV septal defect, which is an endocardial cushion defect, also known as a primum ASD. Congenital rubella is commonly seen in patients with septal defects, patent ductus arteriosus, and pulmonary artery stenosis. Turner syndrome, again, is commonly associated with coarctation of the aorta. Marfan syndrome is associated with aortic insufficiency, as well as aortic root dilatation. And mothers who are diabetic will commonly have babies born with transposition of the great vessels.